What happens when a bowling ball collides with a torso at 240 miles per hour? Is that what you call a strike? Well, thanks to the folks at Ballistics High Speed YouTube channel who were kind enough to send me their incredible footage, we're about to find out. Today's source material grants us the opportunity to study blunt abdominal trauma under gut-wrenching circumstances. Like, quite literally. While this is not a machine gun, it's almost like a gun because it is designed to fire bowling balls. It's literally a bowling ball mortar. And quite an interesting piece of surgical equipment. But before we go any further, please note, this is an educational video. And as such, all depictions of trauma are demonstrated on ballistics gel and carefully contextualized within a lesson on human anatomy in accordance with YouTube's community guidelines. This thing can get up to three or 400 feet per second, I'm told. So that thing is so moving. Cool. Certainly faster than your uncle could ever bullet at the local bowling alley. Now, compared to other projectiles or firearms that we've studied on this channel, a 240 mile per hour bowling ball has some important differences. Mass, velocity, surface area, and shape. Mass and velocity determine how much kinetic energy a projectile carries, which is important because the transfer of kinetic energy from projectile to target is the basic mechanism by which damage is caused. Meanwhile, surface area and shape determine how efficiently this kinetic energy is transferred to the target and what type of trauma, blunt, penetrating, or a combination of both we're dealing with. Close study of ballistic trauma really puts the physics in physician, huh? Well, interns, hang on to your hats because we'll need to break it down a little bit further. Interns, use this time wisely. First up, velocity. The bowling ball is traveling at a much lower velocity than most ballistics. For reference, Even a 22 caliber projectile, which is considered to be low to average velocity, travels somewhere between 700 and 900 miles per hour. While the tank shells that we studied in last week's video travel upwards of 1,000 miles per hour. However, at 12 pounds, our bowling ball has more mass than most projectiles, except perhaps artillery or tank shells. And because of said mass, even at lower velocity, you can be sure it packs a hell of a punch. Furthermore, due to its large surface area and size, the bowling ball will transfer kinetic energy to the target very efficiently, applying blunt force over a wide impact radius. Think alternatively for a moment about a bow or a crossbow bolt, which happen to travel at a similar speed to our bowling ball between 150 and 300 miles per hour or around 200 miles per hour respectively. I told you dude, I'm telling you dude, it ain't gonna go through. They are the antithesis of a bowling ball. Thin, light, and sharp at the tip. Intended to puncture a target and lacerate internal organs and blood vessels in order to create massive blood loss. It's not a prank. Is this a yeah, prank yeah, it's or a not? Prank. Not that bowling balls are typically used as weapons, but this comparison establishes an effective baseline to help us understand why our ballistics gel torso responds the way that it does. Three, two. <laughs> hey. What happened to him? Great question. Can we take a look at the slow-mo? Oh, perfectly centered oh shot. <laughs> Those of you who saw last week's video, or any video about ballistic wound tracks and cavitation, may have noticed the relatively small size, maybe an inch or so wider than the actual bowling ball of the temporary cavity. The temporary expansion of the flesh due to the transfer of kinetic energy as the projectile passes through it. Of course, once the tissue settles, we are left with a permanent cavity where tissues have been displaced or destroyed. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> Look at that splatter pattern. Uh, Great shot by the uh, Treads crew. The bulk of our patient's torso does seem to be relatively intact, though as we'll soon see, a good portion of the anatomy is in fact missing. But first, let's have a look at the difference in temporary cavitation between a tank and a bowling ball. Oh, perfectly centered shot. <laughs> in the case of, say, 
Scorpion tank, we're dealing with a projectile that is similar in mass to the bowling ball, but with a far greater velocity. And as we've discovered in last week's video, as the size and mass of the projectile becomes larger, so too does the size of the temporary cavity. Until the tissue has stretched to such a degree that the size of the hole exceeds its maximum elastic capacity and the tissue fails. The bowling ball has a much harder time passing through the tissue, folding the torso in on itself and dragging it along for the ride before it tears a passage through to the other side. Compared to the tank, the bowling ball projectile distributes less kinetic energy over a wider surface area, which means the body creates more resistance to it. More tissue must be torn before the bowling ball can pass through. This is what One Punch Man might do to a person in real life. Forget those flying bodies. Try. Good job. It literally zipped right through him. Good job, yeah. team. That was awesome. Damn. That's some of the, I mean, what do you think? The transfer of energy happens so quickly that the head remains in place while the body is taken for the ride of its life so to speak. Initiating, but never finishing the common whiplash injury mechanism sequence before the cervical spine is torn from the torso entirely. In a realistic scenario, I doubt that an impact like this would be forceful enough to decapitate the target as seen here, but I would expect dislocations to the cervical vertebrae and strains or tears to the ligaments and tendons located there. Had the skull remain attached, I can imagine the cervical spine snapping briefly into extension and then back into flexion as the torso body is carried backwards. Worrisome, but even extreme whiplash is not a death sentence. If only that were where the story ended. Right underneath the rib cage, like just completely fractures everything. An excellent assessment, Professor. The bowling ball buries itself underneath the costal margin or the bottom edge of the rib cage. The sternum and xiphoid process beneath it are shattered and just about every rib appears to be fractured and displaced with the bottom most sustaining the most damage. This is a terrible spot to sustain an injury like this for several reasons. Both our chest and our abdomen contain organs that are vital to our survival, and most projectiles aren't big enough to damage both regions simultaneously. Oh, that makes me feel some kind of way. Look at this whole spine out the back. <laughs> and the head is just slowly rotating in place. Obviously, this bowling ball is an overachiever. Let's start with the top. Our rib cage comprises 24 ribs, or 12 pairs, and forms a rigid protective layer around our mediastinum, a cavity which houses the heart and major blood vessels, and pleural cavities which house the lungs. All of these structures have been critically disrupted, though likely still intact to some degree. While the heart, lungs, and major vessels do have some inherent flexibility and elasticity that allows them to expand and contract during their normal functioning, the deformation caused by the upper ridge of the bowling ball is simply too much. Not only that, but the bones of the chest wall have been extensively comminuted. That is to say, broken into several small pieces, to such a degree that every soft tissue in the area, organs, vessels, and muscles, runs the risk of laceration from a sharp bone fragment, which will worsen internal bleeding that is already present. A projectile of this size can't simply pass through the target without crudely tearing enough of the tissue in its past to allow for its exit on the other side. In the operating room, I would much rather see a patient with a clean wound, sharp edges, clear wound track, bones without too much fragmentation, than something like this. When presented with a jumbled mess of flesh, organ, bone, blood vessels, etc., I know I'm in for a difficult, difficult operation. When it comes to trauma, we begin immediately with debridement or the removal of dead damaged tissue. A tissue that has been torn through blunt force typically has jagged edges and will likely have sustained more overall damage than a wound from a sharp object. Non-viable parts will be removed along with any dangerous fragments of bone. And then of course comes the repair process. 
But let's be realistic, yo. Not only have the heart, lungs, and great blood vessels been disrupted by the top edge of the bowling ball, but also the diaphragm, abdominal aorta, lower thoracic, and upper lumbar spine have been compromised entirely. Critical damage to any one of these structures could send someone down the river sticks. And all are in the running for the actual mechanism by which our patient's ticket has been punched. By moving up and down, the diaphragm allows your lungs to fill with air when you breathe in and push air out when you breathe out. No diaphragm equals no more breathing. What's that noise? I'm breathing. Get him! The abdominal aorta is one of the largest blood vessels in the body, approximately two to three centimeters in diameter in most individuals, which carries oxygen rich blood from the heart to the organs and tissues in the abdomen and lower extremities. If punctured or worse, ripped apart by an angry bowling ball, exsanguination or life-threatening loss of blood could occur in a matter of minutes. A truly conservative estimate considering the amount of other structures that would also be bleeding. Hemorrhagic shock, a condition where the vital organs are not getting enough blood and characterized by a rapid heart rate, low blood pressure and loss of consciousness is in fact inevitable here. Together with the inability to breathe, our patient will be lights out very quickly. Oh my gosh, his spine is outside of his Dead body. Center. Completely blew his <laughs> spine out. That's about the diameter of a bowling ball, isn't it? Right. That is a frighteningly large portion of the spine. I will point out that due to the design of the ballistics dummy with a metal rod connecting all vertebral segments, a realistic impact may have removed less of the spine, but five vertebrae instead of maybe eight isn't really gonna change much. You see, the vertebrae have a dual function in the body. One, they serve as the structural framework of the spine, providing support and stability. Two, they form a bony canal called the spinal canal, which houses and shields the delicate spinal cord from potential injuries. Our spinal cord is the information superhighway that carries messages between our body and our brain, facilitating movement, feeling, and many important functions like breathing and digestion. When it is severed or removed, everything below that level of injury stops working. Oh. Split apart, man. Oh my God. Yeah. Man, look at that. Holy that God. shouldn't. Okay. From this angle, it appears as though the permanent cavity is actually smaller than the size of the bowling ball. A testament to the elasticity of human tissue. Some of them retaining shape as the ball tore through. Let's have a look at what organs lie on the periphery of the wound track. The kidneys and liver, both particularly sensitive to trauma and extremely painful when struck, would all likely have sustained a glancing blow. In MMA, a strike targeting one of these organs can easily ground a fighter and even knock them out if delivered with enough force. Thus, perhaps our patient lost consciousness almost immediately upon impact, making for a slightly more humane passing. Also worth noting, a blow to the solar plexus, pretty much dead center where the bowling ball impacted the dummy, can be equally debilitating, though less likely to cause a loss of consciousness. When this network of nerves located in the upper abdomen is disrupted, the diaphragm may be <laughs> temporarily unable to function. But as we've already seen, you know, back like several months ago when I first thought of this, I almost had this exact image in my head. There is no more diaphragm. The stomach would also be missing, leaving a monstrous tear in the digestive tract and perhaps bursting upon impact. There will be digestive fluid and partially digestive food contaminating the wound tract. Worse yet, the uppermost portion of the large intestine, the transverse colon, where food becomes excrement, is directly in the line of fire, as well as the jejunum and possibly the ileum of the small intestine as well. The body really doesn't function well when contaminants from the digestive tract enter the bloodstream or disrupt the balance of beneficial bacteria in the gut. You don't say. And infection can result. You don't say. Of course, if our patient were dealing with infection, it would mean they somehow lived to tell the tale. And that in turns would be truly miraculous. Oh. <laughs> it's like the spine pulled out more stuff. Yeah. He really ripped his spine out. Well, that's the thing. The human body is generally pretty well integrated, one tissue with the next. 
All along the length of the spine, muscles attach to it via tendons and ripping such a large portion of the spine out of the body would require each of those junctions to be torn or pulled out along with it. The serratus, latissimus dorsi and spinalis muscles to name only a few. All main structures and organs aside, there are myriad forms of membranes and connective tissue that hold us tightly together. We can wave goodbye to the peritoneum, a membrane that lines the abdominal cavity and covers the organs within it. And at the area of impact, the fascia, which is a fibrous connective tissue that forms a network throughout the body, surrounding and supporting muscles, organs, and other structures. The list goes on. Holy yuck. And then the head, we knew that's, we knew well, that was. the important question is, Chris, do you think he survived? Well, Professor, unfortunately, I don't think our patient is gonna make it. Another ballistic dummy sacrificing life and limb in order to deepen our understanding of human anatomy. Shout out to those interns who correctly guessed the subject of this week's video. Please let me know what you'd like to see me cover next in the comments down below. Remember to check out my online gym, Human 2.0, for free right here on YouTube, where we help you prevent injury and move better. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, to one, teach one.